Alexander the Great, of Macedonian Greek royalty. His reputation is known all around the world. Alexander was born great. He achieved greatness, and he had greatness thrust upon him. He was trained to not only be wise, but to be one of the world's greatest conquerors. His wars against the Persians are legendary. He was even crowned a pharaoh of Egypt. But why was this foreign man welcomed into Egypt? Was there something more to his presence here? Or was it because of the close ties between Greece and Egypt? Alexander is surrounded in myth. He ventured out far into the desert to speak to the Egyptian oracle at Siwa. I'm literally walking in the same footsteps as Alexander the Great. But what really happened here when he was proclaimed as the son of the god Amun? Alexander the Great is not to roof to the Egyptians and to all the world that he is not only human, he is a son of God. For 2,000 years, the story of Alexander in Egypt has been simmered down to barely a footnote. Now, join me, Curtis Ryan Woodside, as I investigate what Alexander really did during his time in Egypt and discover his legacy as a pharaoh who emulated the greats before him. The mysteries behind Alexander's death and afterlife. We learn about Alexander's brother, Philip III, who became pharaoh after him. As well as Alexander's mother's plots to retain Egypt and the empire. Come with as we reveal Alexander, the Great Pharaoh. Alexander III was born as a prince of Macedonia in July 356 BC in the Greek Macedonian state of Pella. His mother was named Olympia and his father was King Philip II. Alexander grew up being well educated by some of ancient Greece's most notable men. Apart from being very intelligent, Ancient sources write that Alexander had a great love of reading and learning about many different subjects. The young prince was very determined and hardworking. At his young age, he didn't care much for frivolity. I think three people had a huge influence on Alexander. Aristotle, his father Philip and his mother. In fact, I feel the influence of Aristotle the most learned and celebrated philosopher of his time cannot be underestimated. When he was appointed the tutor of the young prince, he was given the task of educating the future king. Aristotle of Polymath taught Alexander an array of subjects, including philosophy, ethics, science, and politics. It was an education aimed at not just creating a knowledgeable ruler, but also a wise one. It's also interesting and wonderful actually that he instilled in Alexander a curiosity about the natural world. This is evident by Alexander's support for scientific research during his campaigns, including the cataloguing of new plant and animal species, and also the founding of the city of Alexandria, which later under the Ptolemies would house the famous library and also would become the cultural hub of learning and research. 
He was also trained as a soldier from a very young age. Although much of his life would have been comfortable being a prince, he and his family did face many challenges, particularly from the Persians who were rapidly expanding their empire and making advances towards Greece and its province of Macedon. Philip had made alliances with many of the Persian opponents. By 337 BC, he had given refuge to several Persian noblemen. Alexander was in the court of his father by this time, as he was 20 years old. He heard firsthand many of the issues which would arise from the Persians. He valued these men's valor. King Philip then went into Asia Minor to liberate Greek settlements from the Persians. All seemed to be going well, as Philip and his 10,000 men strong army were victorious. However, when Philip returned to Macedonia, everything was about to change for Philip. In 336 BC, Philip married another noblewoman named Cleopatra. Olympia was furious at this move from her husband King. This obviously caused tensions in the family as Olympia and her son Alexander fled into exile in Epirus, where Olympia's brother was King. Historians are divided on what happened next, but the theory I like to believe goes as follows. A personal guard of the King Philip was working with Olympia who wanted her son to become king of Macedon. Alexander returned to Macedonia without his mother, and then it happened. King Philip was assassinated by his guard. Olympia returned home on the night of this incident. Many believe that Olympia was behind Philip's assassination. Immediately, while Philip's body was still warm, the nobles and army proclaimed Alexander as the new king. He was 20 years old. This was the moment that Alexander would start his journey on becoming one of history's most notable figures, creating one of the biggest empires the world had ever seen. When Alexander became king, the Persians were ruling over their vast empire, including Egypt. For many years, Alexander had several campaigns against Persian invasion. However, in 333 BC, Alexander fought against the Persian king Darius. This battle is known as the Battle of Issus. This is where Alexander had chased the Persian king back into Egypt. Naturally, Alexander followed Darius further south toward Egypt. Along the way, Alexander had taken control over many of the Persian-ruled cities. It was at Gaza, a city that the Persians had taken over in 332 BC. After three attempts, Alexander again defeated the Persians. Darius again fled, but this time went back to Persia. With this battle, the Persian rule in Egypt came to an end. Alexander was finally able to enter Egypt. At Pompeii in Italy, a mosaic in the house of a noble Greco-Egyptian man was created 100 years after Alexander chased the Persians out of Egypt. This beautiful mosaic made from one and a half million tiles, shows the moment Alexander the Great caused Darius to flee back to Persepolis. This mosaic has a perfect home in Pompeii, as many of the people living there did have Greek and Egyptian roots. They wanted to pay tribute to the great Alexander. Now that Darius had surrendered Egypt, Alexander was about to be given the ultimate title. He was about to become a god. Upon entering the Egyptian border in mid-332 BC, 
Alexander was greeted by the Egyptian people with open arms as their liberator from the Persians. But why would the local Egyptians do this? The answers can be found in an Egyptian tomb dating back 1,400 years prior to Alexander's arrival to around 1,700 BC. On Luxor's west bank, a tomb of the nobleman named Rekmira shows a great relationship between Greeks and Egyptians. In this tomb, we can see the Minoan Greeks arriving in Egypt with many gifts for the pharaoh Tutmosis III. The tomb of Rechmira shows us people from all over the world bringing offerings to Egypt. We can see men from Nubia bringing in a beautiful giraffe with a monkey holding the giraffe's neck. More Nubian men bringing in ostrich feathers and carrying ostrich eggs. Ivory from elephants, wood, baboons, even a cheetah. It is so incredible to see this. All the offerings arriving from Nubia. At the top, we have the people from Crete, the Greeks bringing in jewelry, gold, and vessels, and probably containing wine or even beer. Presenting it to Rechmira to count, to add into, the tax breakdown for Pharaoh Tutmosis III. And just a few hundred years later, in the reign of Ramses II, the Mycenaeans were also known to have close ties with the Pharaoh. Bronze Greek armor has been found in Greece, with the cartouche of Ramses II stamped on, as they served in the Egyptian army. Even the wife and queen of Ramses, Nefertari, is known to have exchanged letters and gifts with the Greek queens. They, in return, sent Nefertari some beautiful gifts, including a pair of silver earrings that Nefertari shows in her tomb with great pride. You see, for thousands of years, the Egyptians had faced wars with every country neighboring them, all except one. Greece. The ancient Egyptians and the Greeks always had a good camaraderie, and with that in mind, it makes perfect sense that the Egyptians welcomed Alexander to Egypt. The legend says that upon his arrival in Egypt, a large flock of birds were flying to the west. An Egyptian priest told Alexander that this was a sign and that he should follow the birds. Alexander and his men followed these birds and arrived at a distant place in the middle of the desert, an oasis, Siwa. This is where Alexander's dreams would become a reality. They rode through this landscape, which has scarcely changed since then, arriving at this mount. Here was the temple of Amun that housed the oracle. The temple was built around 700 BC by Greek mercenaries who settled in the area. The temple is a unique mix of Egyptian and Greek architecture, built right at the edge of the hill. Throughout history, many notable people would come to this temple to ask questions to the god Amun, where the oracle priest would answer on behalf of the god. This is where one of history's most powerful men once visited. I'm literally walking in the same footsteps as Alexander the Great up these steps. I'm gonna take you in the Amun Temple where Alexander received his message from the Oracle. However, 
what happened in these hallowed halls remains somewhat of a mystery still. So this is where Alexander would have walked into, come in here, right in the center would be a statue of Amun-Ra, and Alexander would have spoken to Amun, asked him whatever questions took place, we're not exactly sure, and Amun spoke back to him. When Amun spoke back to him, he said, Alexander, Alexandros, you are my son. And this legitimized Alexander's claim to becoming a pharaoh. Alexander would have left. As he left, he swept away his footprints. He was given a broom from one of the priests. He swept away his footprints and left the room. This is one version of the story. Now, there is a debate happening as, as to exactly how the oracle gave him this message. The oracle is, of course, a high priest that would probably take a hallucinogenic and see these visions and speak as the voice of the god. The voice would come either from above or from below. We're not exactly sure on which one of these theories is correct. In this room, I believe we would have had the statue of Amun. It makes sense. All Egyptian temples show the god in the central room. And above, there is a ledge and a window. And I believe it is that window where the oracle would have sat and spoken down. And Alexander would have heard that voice, believing it to be the voice of Amun himself. We have this little passage on the side here where... It's blocked off now, but long ago, there's a staircase going up to that exact window that I spoke about now, where I believe the oracle would sit and speak down as the voice of Amun. This is the one that I like to believe. This is where the oracle was in the version of the story I like. There's another version where they believe in this room, in the third room, down here is a well with an entrance from the outside. Because on the other side of this wall, it is a steep cliff on the mountain. The oracle or the high priest would come in through this doorway, go into the well, and speak up as the voice of Amun. And in this room, we have the area where the sound could come through, like a well, and through the hole here in the ground, there's, you can see the sunlight coming through. That would connect and the sound could come through. And it's believed that over here would have stood in one of the versions, the statue of Amun, and the oracle's voice would come out from here. So there is a debate going around as to exactly which room this took place in. I prefer the central room as it makes more sense with Egyptian beliefs. A third theory, which is a combination of both, which is Alexander came into this room. There was already a carved window here. The oracle went up the stairs and spoke through that window, which is more likely because we have the Temple of Horus where we have the window above which has the oracle speaking from above. So that makes more sense than a well. Alexander would have come and stood exactly on this block that I'm standing on now and looked through this hole and spoke to Amun through the hole. And he would not be able to see the oracle sitting above. It's blocked off, thus creating the illusion that it is the statue of Amun speaking. And he could speak to Amun through here because... Only the high priest and a pharaoh was allowed to go into the main sanctuary. And Alexander would speak to Amun through here, and this is where he received his message, on this block, standing here speaking to the god. So we're not exactly sure which version of the story to believe. I prefer the first one where Alexander was allowed right in front of the priest. But all three of these stories are plausible. Once Alexander was proclaimed as the son of Amun, 
he allegedly was processioned through the village, accompanied by 80 priests of Amun. Amun was the principal god of Egypt. He was also known as the god of the gods. He was seen as the equal to the Greek god Zeus, and in many instances, they were combined, creating Zeus Amun. Very few images still remain in the temple, yet we can see some scenes of Amun with his wife Mut. The cartouche of Pharaoh Amasis has been found in this site, which makes even more sense being built by Greek mercenaries, as Pharaoh Amasis had sent much gold to help rebuild the burnt-down temple of Delphi in Greece. Of course, this temple is surrounded in myth, Perseus was said to have visited here before beheading Medusa, and Hercules may also have been here once. The temple and the village of Agurmi surrounding it was said to have been founded by two banished Theban priestesses, one of which went to Greece and founded the temple of Dodona. Another foundation myth is that the Greek god Dionysus was lost in the Libyan desert. Almost about to die from thirst, a figure appeared and led him to the spring of Agurmi. To give thanks for his life, he erected the temple and blessed the oasis to become forever fertile. All of these are good stories, but are myths. The reality is, it was built by the Greek mercenaries, the men that aided the Egyptian army. And many years later, even Alexander's father would come here. Alexander the Great actually had a connection to, to Egypt before, right? Yes, uh, since it's basmatic uh, from the 26th dynasty, there's a tent of uh, a large number of Greek, and they settled in Egypt uh, as a mercenaries because Basmatic used them as a mercenaries in their, his, his army. Yes. And also the relationship between Greece and Egypt, it is since uh, very thousands, old time. Thousands of years. Thousands of years, and yeah. the trade ways also, and everything. Plus, the father of Alexander the Great, he was mercenary in Laxor. Philip. For, uh, uh, yeah. Philip, King Philip. He was mercenary in Laxor for a while. And he learned the technique, which it was since the time of Tutmos III, yes. make uh, separate uh, flanks mm -hmm. and separate forces. So specific technique in a war. He learned it and he taught Alexander that, which he used it later to make his empire. So the Greeks and the Egyptians, they've always had this, this strong connection. Yes. We know from the time of Tutmosis III, we can see the Greeks arriving in some of the tombs and they're giving gifts. Yes, and also uh, you, uh, you mentioned that before, Ramses II, he has a temple there mm -hmm. in Greece and it's heavy In later. Cyprus. In, in Cyprus. Cyprus, yeah. So they do a lot of respect and we don't forget also uh, the god Serapis, yes. which make it by Ptolemy I to unify the Egyptian and the Greece. <laughs> Exactly. The Greek. Exactly. Nefertari was writing letters to the Greeks. Yeah. She received gifts from the Greeks. So we have a long history of Egypt and Greece. And you know, Greece is the only country that Egypt never fought with. Never. And until now, we have good relationship. Yeah. They, they said falafel and coffee and everything is yeah. Greek. And we and said it's Egyptian. And and the biscuits yeah. and everything. They said it's a Greek <laughs> and we say it's Egyptians. The war that is a Greek. Exactly. Yeah. So Alexander's father was a mercenary in Luxor. Yes. But was that really Alexander's father? Mm. Mm -hmm. Much myth even surrounds Alexander the Great. His mother Olympia often corresponded with her son during his campaigns. She tried to convince him that his father was not in fact Philip II, but rather that he was the son of a god. This gave rise to the medieval myth that the last native pharaoh of Egypt, Nectanebo, when he was conquered by the Persians, rather than fleeing south to Nubia, as was historically stated, that he went north to Greece, where he met with Olympia. He told her that the god Amun would visit her that night, and so Amun did, Yet Olympia was deceived. 
Nectanebo was dressed in the guise of Amu and impregnated Olympia, thus conceiving Alexander the Great. Oh yes, this all sounds wonderful. However, this was merely a myth, but had it been true, it would be yet another feather in the cap for Alexander to explain why the Egyptians embraced him, as he would have had a claim to being Pharaoh, as he was supposedly the son of Pharaoh. Philip played a crucial role in Alexander's life. In fact, without Philip, they couldn't have been an Alexander the Great. Philip's the one who reshaped Northern Greece, making it stronger and more united. Philip's also the one who created the army that Alexander would inherit. And even the plan to attack Persia was Philip's. We have to remember that even Philip was relatively young when he came to the throne and in such a short space of time he almost achieved the unthinkable. It's obvious he had an influence on Alexander's life who would go on to surpass his father's accomplishments. But his relationship with his father was sometimes distant and fractured. Alexander was much closer to his mother. The dark side of Alexander which would sometimes manifest itself in bouts of anger, acts of cruelty, and even destruction, was probably the result of the world in which he grew up in and the relationship he had with his parents. Even his mother was a strong individual who had high ambitions for her son. She's even implicated in the assassination of Philip. Whether or not this is true, after Alexander's father was killed, Alexander would leave and go on to conquer the world and never return to see his mother again. In fact, at no point does he call for his mother or even show the desire to see his mother again. All their communication would be through letters back and forth. Alexander the Great, he wants to roof to the Egyptians and to all the world that he's not only human, he's a son of God. So it will help him later when he make his empire and it will help also his mission in Egypt to control them like the native pharaohs, sons of the gods. Alexander left Siwa as the son of God. He ventured on and arrived in Memphis. The news had spread of the visit to Siwa. Alexander was then crowned as Pharaoh of all Egypt, gracing him with the red and white crowns and placing his name in a royal cartouche. Here at Memphis, Alexander gave many offerings to the god Ptah, the chief regional god of Memphis. Being Pharaoh, Alexander became even more powerful. The army of Egypt would be at his disposal, and the wealth of Egypt would help him to expand his empire. After his coronation in Memphis, Alexander went south to visit the home of his spiritual father Amun. He visited the great temple of Amun at Karnak. Now Pharaoh, he was allowed into the inner sanctuary, where a small golden statue of Amun rested in a shrine. Alexander would have come here and performed a ceremony reserved only for the Pharaoh and the High Priests. The inner sanctuary at Karnak Temple, dedicated to Amun Ra. Right in the center, we have this plinth where the statue of the god Amun would be placed. The boat would be placed here as well. Every morning, the priests would come in, open the doors, and adorn the statue of Amun Ra with oils, makeup, leave offerings. And before they left, they would sweep their footprints away, leaving the house of the god in immaculate state. This, right here, was the center of ancient Egypt.
slight traces of Alexander remain on the walls of this sanctuary. In the grounds of Karnak, a large statue depicting Alexander would be erected. He wears the Egyptian Nemes headdress, yet appears as a Greek, with his hair poking through the band and his neck slightly tilted to one side, a characteristic from all depictions of Alexander. The newly crowned foreign pharaoh would then visit the Ipet Reset Temple, the southern sanctuary, now known as Luxor Temple. At Luxor Temple, Alexander commissioned the inner sanctuary to be extended. He had a new shrine built in the existing sanctuary, where he showed himself giving many offerings to Amun wearing various crowns of Egypt, like the blue Kepresh war crown. We can see Alexander and Amun Min. We know it's Alexander from his name. Yeah. Alexandros. Yeah. Alexandros. Alexandros. Here we have Alexander the Great offering jars to Amun Min with his erect, circumcised penis. Yes. But there's something interesting happening here that you told me about. What's going on, Lamy? Something coming out from the semen because Alexander, uh, Amun men ejaculating in front of Alexander the Great. So from semen, there's something similar to sperm comes out. We have controversial here. Mm -hmm. Some people said the thickest was here. And someone he just connect between the scene and also the penis of Amun. So it's controversial until now. We can understand really what's going on. If it's a sperm, did the ancient Egyptian invent microscopes? I doubt that. Yeah, they knew something. Uh huh. Yeah, but it's interesting we see that because we have a festival once a year where the pharaoh had to ejaculate into the Nile yeah. to keep the Nile fertile, fertile in front of an audience. Yeah. So it is very weird and at the same time part of their culture. We can, maybe we can understand it, but by their time it's uh, very understood yeah. or acceptable too. Yeah. In the inner sanctuary at Luxor Temple would have been housed the boat that had the statue of the god Honsu, the son of Amun and Mut. The boat for Honsu had the head of a ram, a symbol for the son of Amun. And once a year, the boat would be taken out and brought to Karnak Temple down the avenue of Sphinxes. Alexander the Great here, he wear the crown of south and there he wear the crown of north. And behind him, the provinces of ancient Egypt in south. Above each one of them, the name of the province. So here we have like Itfu. And here we have a female, the only exception here. Do you know why? Because she is Luxor, Waset. He wanted to recognize Luxor and make Luxor like distinguished. That's why he made it as a lady. A pharaoh was seen as the reincarnation of Horus, and thus Alexander's wish had come true. He was a god. Being the son of Amun, too, meant he was a god on earth. It would have been here in Luxor, where Alexander saw the power of the pharaohs. Amongst them was Ramses II. Alexander saw the might of this king and the empire he wielded strewn across the walls of the temples. Alexander would adopt the symbol which mighty pharaohs like Ramses had been ordained to wear. He showed himself wearing the curved ram's horns showing the sheer power connected 
to Amu. Inside this smaller section of Luxor Temple is a piece of Ramses the Second, shown here, with the ram's horns of Amu, the ram's horns that would be repeated by every pharaoh that wanted to be connected to the reign of Ramses the Great. Alexander emulated the great pharaohs such as Ramses to take on their strength to build his empire. He commissioned new coins of himself showing the ram's horns of Amun so that all throughout his empire would know he was pharaoh. We don't often see Alexander the Great depicted as an Egyptian or even as a pharaoh, only on a couple of statues and carvings. However, here we have something so unique. It is Alexander depicted as the god Hapi before an offering table with fish and plants hanging off of the offering table. Isn't he just the most magnificent example of Greek and Egyptian art combined? One of Alexander the Great's favorite things that he found when he came to Egypt was the hoopoe bird, and he had it depicted in many temples. And this here is the favorite bird of Alexander the Great. Alexander then went up north to the Nile Delta and visited the ancient city of Bubastis. In this city, many artifacts pertaining to Alexander were found, like thousands of silver coins and a terracotta statue showing Alexander as the god Hercules, showing he had a presence in the city. Alexander was not pleased with the taxation system in Egypt and installed new laws implementing the Greek tax systems. Thus, he would make sure that the tributes given would not be misused by any of the priests. In 332 BC, Semitawi saw the liberation of Egypt from the Persians by Alexander the Great. This stela was discovered in Pompeii, Italy. It was written by the Egyptian officialman named Semetawi of his accounts of when Alexander expelled the Persians from Egypt. This is the stela of Semetawi. After Alexander the Great left his short stay in Egypt, however, he remained pharaoh. Semetawi wrote down his accounts of Alexander defeating the Persians. And shortly after Alexander left Egypt, Semetawi became the high priest of the son of Isis, Horus. Alexander set his sights north. He arrived at the Egyptian Mediterranean Sea. There, he is said to have taken bird seed and drawn out a city plan on the ground, thus founding what would become the most powerful city, not only in Egypt, but most of the known world, Alexandria. Alexander would found over 20 cities named after himself. Yet, the Egyptian Alexandria would be the most important and prosperous of all. The great Alexander did not stay in Egypt long, after around six months, he left Egypt in 331 BC, setting his sights to finally defeat Darius and the Persians. After conquering Darius, walking through the gates of Ishtar, Alexander was now also the king of Persia. Alexander went on to conquer as far as India. Alexander was born great. He achieved greatness and he had greatness thrust upon him. Decisions made by leaders can have a profound effect on the course of history, and Alexander and his father, Philip, 
provide the clearest example of this. In less than four decades, Greece would be dominated, Persia, the superpower of the time, would be attacked and defeated, and several other regions would be humbled. Alexander almost achieved global dominance. He went as far as the Hindu Kush and what is now Pakistan. In fact, his presence can still be felt in Pakistan. The wonderful Kalash people who live in the region of Chitra claim to be the descendants of Alexander's army. Their traditions, culture and religious practices are so unique and different from the rest of the region. But what shaped Alexander to become this formidable opponent on the battleground and an unconventional figure with a great mind, charisma and determination. He remained the pharaoh of Egypt for 10 years, yet something would happen to Alexander that he could not conquer. He arrived back in Babylon in June 323 BC. Alexander died. We do not know the exact cause of his death, other than it being mentioned that he had a fever. His death would now cause a fierce power battle between Alexander's court as to who would rule the empire. It seems to have been divided up. The half-brother of Alexander the Great would become the next crowned pharaoh of Egypt, Philip III. Philip proved to be a very weak king of Egypt and Macedon, and served as more of a puppet controlled by more powerful people. Philip III wanted to emulate Alexander the Great. He depicted himself at Karnak Temple. On the outside of Amun's inner shrine are many images of Pharaoh Philip. He is shown being crowned by Amun and other scenes show Alexander's half-brother giving offerings to the gods. Here he is, Philip II. We can see his name up there. P, which is the box, L, I, P, Philip. He was trying to show to the Egyptian people that he was worthy of this title. The same way Alexander was, being seen directly with the gods in the most important temple in all of Egypt. A few months after Philip III was named as pharaoh in 322 BC, Roxanne, one of the wives of Alexander, gave birth to a son named Alexander IV. This young son of Alexander was then also named as pharaoh of Egypt and king of Macedon, therefore co-ruling with Philip III. But Alexander IV was only an infant he was used just as much as Philip was by other people to make their claims of the empire. Though all this time Olympia was not pleased with the son of her dead husband and his other wife being the king of Macedon and Egypt. Olympia returned from exile to Macedonia. Alexander's men refused to kill the woman who bore the most incredible man they had known. However, she conspired against them all, having many of the commander's families killed, and eventually, in 317 BC, Olympia had Philip III murdered. But what happened to Olympia now, the mother of Alexander the Great? The loyal followers of Alexander did not want to kill her. However, they decided that if they got someone else to kill her, it would be acceptable. In 316 BC, Cassander ordered the families of those that Olympia had murdered to commit a violent act. They stoned Olympia to death. In 309 BC, Alexander the Great's son was executed before turning 14 years old, the age at which a Macedonian boy could fully rule. There is a second son of Alexander the Great. However, many debate him as being illegitimate, as many of the Greek and Macedonians refused him as Alexander the Great's son from a mistress. 
but to be sure, they murdered Heracles, the supposed illegitimate son of Alexander the Great. Thus, the entire line of Alexander's family were now gone. Many years of civil war would break out between the rulers of Alexander's empire through many events, an army general and supposed cousin of Alexander from Olympia's side named Ptolemy would become full reigning pharaoh of Egypt and he would create a long dynasty of Ptolemaic rulers ending with the final Greek ruler of Egypt, Cleopatra. This is not the end of Alexander's story though. For millennia, there has been a debate about where the great conqueror had been buried. For you see, holding Alexander's body would have some sort of threshold over the empire. Alexander had been buried in Egyptian style, as this was the religion that he was leaning toward the most. Ptolemy I is said to have moved Alexander's body a few times, leaving Egyptologists, archaeologists, and historians with a real mystery on their hands. At Saqqara, near the ancient capital of Memphis, is something that looks surprisingly un-Egyptian. In Saqqara we find an intriguing semicircle of statues that seem somewhat out of place. Despite their poor preservation, these statues provide an insight into art and cultural development under the Ptolemies. Presently, their surface is quite coarse, but originally they were probably covered in stucco and painted. The statues are thought to be of some of the greatest classical Greek poets and philosophers, including Homer, who wrote the Iliad, a copy of which Alexander is thought to have kept with him during his conquest. There's also the poet Pindar and the famous philosopher Plato, who taught Aristotle, who in turn would go on to teach Alexander the Great. Alexander has done so much in his lifetime, yet for me, Alexander will always be one of my favorite pharaohs. With all that Alexander accomplished, the empire he forged, the myths surrounding him, and the fact that we still speak about him today, and he is still so much part of the world we live in, it is no wonder that he is known as Alexander the Great. <laughs>